Many of these are working as primary care doctors in either the private or public sectors. General practitioners or family physicians, and some prefer to be called, in the private sector offer first contact primary care to those on medical aids or to those who can afford to pay cash for the services. And this is for approximately 16 to 20% of the population. So the questions then are, do we have enough GPs to cater for the healthcare needs of our communities? What role can GPs play in primary health care? What important functions do they perform that contribute to overall health care delivery in our country? What challenges do they have in practicing their profession? And perhaps more importantly, what does the public believe their function and value to be? When people fall ill and are in need of care, why do some of them self-refer to specialists and bypass their GPs? Well, stay tuned, because these are some of the questions we'll tackle in today's show. We focus on the general practitioner, or GP for short. Our guests include important stakeholders from, from healthcare, from the Health Professions Council of South Africa, or HPCSA, the South African Medical Association, or SAMA, and practicing GP. So sit back, relax, and learn from this exciting show ahead. You can be part of the show by calling us with your questions or views on Johannesburg 714-6843-6847 or 6857. Or interact with us on our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk, and on Twitter at SABC Health Talk. I'm Dr. Selo Mutau, and this is Health Talk. Equitable distribution of healthcare workers between rural and urban areas is one of the Department of Health's priority. Research has shown that globally, medical students from rural areas are more likely to return to practice there once they graduate. But this has not been demonstrated in South Africa. A study released by Health System Trust shows that South African medical students who come from rural areas do not go back to practice there. There are many reasons why healthcare workers are reluctant to work in rural areas. According to the South African Health Review 2011, healthcare workers shy away from rural areas because of, amongst others, the burden of HIV AIDS in state hospitals and clinics. The major challenge really is underdevelopment within the rural environments. The lack of infrastructure goes with that. The, 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 the equipment and the whole setting in the rural environment makes it very, very difficult to operate there. There are also very limited opportunities for any young doctor to grow in that setting as well. The World Health Organization says globally, there is a shortage of 7.2 million healthcare workers. The organization warns that, if not addressed, this shortage will increase to 12.9 million in 2035. This challenge is most profound in sub-Saharan Africa, which carries 25% of the global burden of disease, but only 3% of the world's health workers. According to the South African Department of Health, the shortage of healthcare professionals stood at 80,000 in 2011, but private clinics and hospitals which serve 8 million people had the majority of doctors, meaning the remaining 42 million of people had to share only 30% of doctors. I was working for an NGO in the rural setting, but I was the only doctor in that setting as well. We covered a very wide environment and we had to drive actually to the health, to the health facilities there, which proved very challenging. It is people in the rural areas who are mostly affected by the shortage of doctors, not only in government hospitals, but also in private practice. Figures show that 23 million people in South Africa live in the rural areas, but have access to only 12% of the doctors who work in government facilities. Nine of South Africa's medical schools produce about 1,200 doctors a year. 600 of them will prefer to work abroad. 450 of them will work in the private sector. Majority of the remaining doctors will work in the urban areas. Then about 35 doctors will serve rural areas of South Africa. Hmm. So there's a shortage of doctors. Is there a shortage of doctors rather in rural areas or an oversupply of them in the urban areas? Well, our guests will help us tackle that question. First up in Johannesburg, we have uh, Dr. Khosi Litlape. Dr. Litlape is president of the Health Professions Council of South Africa or HPCSA and also chair of the Medical and Dental Board. Dr. Litlape, welcome to Health Talk. Uh, thank you for the invite. Salute. All right. And, and perhaps before we go on to say congratulations on your new appointment as the president of the HPCSA. 
Thank you. All right, and then we cross up to Cape Town, to our Cape Town studio. We have Pro Professor Shadrach or Shadrick Mazaza. I need to correct myself there. Um, Professor Mazaza is the Sama Specialist Private, Private Practice Committee Chairperson. Professor Mazaza, welcome to Health Talk. Good morning, yes. All right. Uh, Perhaps I'm let's, glad to be here. Yeah, let's start with you then, Prof. Um, you know, okay. um, there's this notion around, or at least some confusion when it comes to terminology that we use. We're talking, I mean, this show we're saying it's, it's on the general practitioner. Let's just define terms uh, a bit. What is a general practitioner, and is that different from a family physician or a physician for that matter? Yes. Um, yes, uh, there is sometimes confusion uh, about those terms. Uh, general practitioners are really the, those who practice after graduation, uh, you know, without uh, postgraduate training as specialists in any field. Uh, and so the term that's used in South Africa is general practitioner. Um, another term that's used to describe general practitioners is family doctors, right. uh, which is exactly the same as general practitioners. So family doctor, general practitioner, or sometimes uh, family practitioner mean the same thing. They mean general practitioners. Right. In South Africa, the term family physicians is reserved for those who, general practitioners as you, uh, or family doctors, who have had extra training uh, besides or in, in addition to their general degree, specifically to practice in general practice. So family physicians are more or less general practitioners with postgraduate training uh, in family practice. But in terms of the scope of work now, are you then therefore saying that there's a difference between the level of expertise between a family physician and a general practitioner? Uh, yes, there is. And the, the difference is, uh, obviously, the curriculum is, is, is different. All doctors, uh, when they graduate, they obviously train in all fields of medical practice. Uh, and others afterwards uh, will specialize in some area like uh, heart diseases or lung diseases or kidney diseases. Um, and general practitioners are those who continue to practice, in other words, to deal with their patients, to deal with any problem that patients present to them. But to do this task, they don't necessarily have particular training, at least not in South Africa until now. Uh, specialist physicians or family physicians have extra training over and above the general training they had in medical school to deal with the challenges of uh, general practice. Okay. And Perhaps. so the scope is different. I may mention just one thing, which yeah. we, in medical school, we, we are trained largely to look for diseases, to listen to patients, examine them, do some tests to identify whether there is a, a problem physically, uh, and then of, uh, give the treatment that's required. All right. Family physicians are trained to go beyond that. Uh, we, we talk about three-stage assessment, not just clinical, which is looking for disease, but also personal and contextual, which means that you deal with a patient in a bit more comprehensively than, was, uh, uh, trained, than we were trained for in medical school. So the scope is much wider than it is. All right. For general practitioners who haven't had that training. Let me invite comment from the council. Now, Dr. Letlape, you've, you've heard the discussion around, you know, the issue of family physician. In terms of licensing and regulation, can you perhaps just comment on the process of licensing general practitioners um, and, and perhaps comment on the issue of the family physician? I think the, the problem is that, as Dr. Professor Mazaza explained, after you qualify from medical school and you've done your internship and done your community service, you then registered as a medical practitioner in independent practice. Right. Uh, if you undergo further training in certain defined specialities where your scope of practice becomes narrowed, as a general practitioner, your scope of practice is wide and you're expected to do things that you are trained for that you're competent and confident with. 
When you specialize, you will narrow your field, you'll undergo further training, which is usually around five years. You'd then be registered as a specialist in that discipline. Now, family physicians undergo further training. And I think the biggest challenge of areas that are not clearly defined is that the scope of practice remains pretty much the same as the scope of practice of general practitioners. So, but does the council then differentiate between family physicians and general practitioners in terms of recognition as it were? Well, if you've done the course, the postgraduate course, that course will be recognized by council. Yeah. And I think the areas that the profession needs to take further yeah. is how do you distinguish then between a general practitioner and a family physician? Okay. And, and that's the area that needs to be explored. Oh. If you go back into the history, uh, when the issue of further training for general practitioners was introduced, it was not envisaged that you'd be creating a different category. Yeah. What was envisaged was that you'd have people that are more experienced when they get into general practice, yeah. general practice because they have further training. Yeah. But it does not necessarily mean that the general practitioner has lesser knowledge and expertise as compared to your family physicians in general. Well, what would be clear is that a general practitioner has lesser formal training yeah. than a family physician. All right. As All right. to whether well, the lesser uh, training yeah. equates to a difference in competence, that is the matter that the profession needs to elaborate upon. All right. Okay. Professor Mazaza, just back to you now. Um, when it comes to li licensing issues, obviously, uh, you know, you mentioned the training that, you know, if you want to become a GP, you just go through uh, the normal basic training. You do your uh, uh, community service and internship and so on, and you can just basically set up practice. Now, we've heard stories about, you know, bogus doctors, you know, setting up practice. Your period in terms of how easy it is to just set up practice. Well, as things stand at the moment, uh, to set up independent or private practice, uh, you require the degree MBCHB uh, from a medical school and having done the, what is required after that, as uh, Dr. Letrape has said, um, is all that's required. Now, let me you know, um, just agree with what Dr. Letrape has just said. When we started the process of uh, vocational training for general practitioners, uh, we didn't actually anticipate that we will end up uh, introducing a specialty in family medicine. But that's what happened. So there was a change midway uh, from just vocational training to become a better trained general practitioner, as it is in, say, in the United Kingdom, Canada, or Australia, uh, to actually training family physician who is going to be trained just like any other specialty. In other words, four years of training as a registrar in medical school, which is not the case in the UK or the other countries that do that. All right. So Prof we do Prof have a specialist discipline. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's why the competencies are actually very different, much, much deeper in general practice than the general practitioner. Okay. Now, Prof, we, we need to just keep hold it there because we need to go for a quick commercial break. When we come back, I'm going to ask for a response or a comment from the council's view in terms of uh, what we've just discussed. And of course, we hear more about concerns and challenges of the GP. Stay with us. Africa's tech scene is constantly coming up with innovative ways to answer some of the continent's problems. We source content from social media, uh, from mobile, our mobile apps, from our website. And as people move from phone calls to data, companies have to switch what they offer. People expect to get higher speeds, better quality broadband for less. On Network, we have information on Africa's technology and social media scene. 
That's Network with me, Pumene Lezondi, every Sunday at 9 p.m. Central African time, only on SABC News. Get all the latest news from the SABC's online news services on our website. Breaking news and in-depth coverage of everything from business, sports to politics and lifestyle. Catch the top news clips and watch live streaming of major news events on the SABC News YouTube channel whenever. Stay connected on the SABC News Facebook page and have your say on news that matters to you. And for the latest headlines and live updates from our reporters, follow us on Twitter. SABC Digital News, anytime, anywhere. Uh, now, every profession has its own unique challenges, some positive, some negative. Some may relate to the working environment, difficult clients, declining sales, you know, due to tough economic times. And then let's find out from our guests what concerns and challenges GPs face in their practice. Now, in Johannesburg, we still have Dr. Khosli the president of HPCSA, and we're now joined by Dr. Lynn Lishange, herself a practicing general practitioner in Pretoria. Welcome to Health Talk, Dr. Shange. Thank you very much for the invitation. All right. Now, in our Cape Town studio, um, we, we, we still have one of our guests, but we'll get back to Cape Town just now. I want to start with you, Dr. Shang. In my introduction, I said, look, you know, every profession has its own challenges. Let's hear about the challenges that GPs have in their normal day-to-day -day practice. Perhaps let's start with the patient. Any challenges around the patient, the public, as it were? All right. Uh, I think the question is actually quite broad. Um, but I'll just try and narrow it down. Uh, if you're just talking about the patient and the public, anyway, that is the person that the GP is concerned about. And if you talk about a day in the life of a general practitioner, that is our bread and butter, the patient. But I think if the relationship was just between the patient and the doctor, I doubt if there will be many challenges. I think at the present moment is because the relationship is not just a patient-doctor relationship. There is a lot of, I will call it a middle man, even though it's not just one person. But because of that, then the relationship between the doctor and the patient uh, changes. Who is the middle man? <laughs> uh, the middle man can be anything from the, uh, the regulators, um, from the medical aids, and uh, even now I have, I was one of my colleagues from the HPSA, I mean they are part and process of what transpires between myself and the patient. So as a general practitioner, I don't only have to fulfill my responsibility towards the patient alone, but I've got a whole of these other entities around me that I have to put into consideration into this patient-doctor relationship. Okay. So let's, let's just perhaps get a different perspective or slightly similar perspective from somebody else, but not you, Dr. Lutlape. We have something that we want to show our public. Please take a look at this. A general practitioner, also called the GP, is a physician who does not specialize in one particular area of medicine. GPs provide routine healthcare like physical examinations, immunization, and treat many different conditions, including illnesses and injuries. They often have regular long term patients and provide ongoing medical care to both male and female patients of all age groups. You know, in, in family medicine, family medicine is about people, basically. Uh, you meet different people with different ailments and different complaints. So every day, you know, no two days are the same. Um, but, but also, you know, um, being a doctor is, is a very satisfying, a very gratifying job. Traditionally, GPs are the first level of primary health care in a private health care system. Patients have over the years trusted their GPs to provide health care and to refer them to a specialist should a need arise. In addition, they are faced with a quadruple burden of disease, including a wide range of infectious diseases, a rapidly growing incident of chronic lifestyle diseases, a high incident of trauma and a wide range of maternal and perinatal conditions. We, we face challenges, I suppose, um, every day. You know, one of the the hardest things um, I don't like doing, and which is quite 
painful. You know, with, with um, the HIV uh, uh, scourge we have in the country, you know, children who are born with HIV, yeah, the hardest thing is that obviously, you know, all children have to be on ARVs. We, that, that's fact. But the question is always, when do you tell the child? How do you tell the child? It's, it's a very difficult thing. And sometimes the more you delay it, you know, you run the risk of them finding out from other sources. You know, if they're taking these medicines, even children have smartphones these days. You know, they can Google their medication, they can do whatever. So that, that's always, for me, that's always the hardest, you know, to tell a child that, look, uh, you are going to have to be on medication for the rest of your life. GPs in a private practice have a smaller pool of patients they care for than in a public sector. But they have to work very intensively in providing continuity of care to their patients. It plays a big role in my life, especially for me and my children, because he's been a great assistant. Okay, um, he made our, our future and our lives so easy because we don't go sick or we, we, we don't get sick easily since we, he has been our practitioner. You know, people are supposed to be looking for better care. And sometimes there is that perception in the community that uh, maybe if you want the best, you must go and see a specialist. But that's, uh, that has got in, inherent problems because patients self-referrals, patients end up seeing the, um, the wrong specialist. GPs are concerned about patients self-referring directly to a specialist. But perhaps the time has come for South African GP to reclaim their rightful role in a system and for patients to be encouraged to first seek medical attention at an appropriate level of care. It not only provides... Right, welcome back. Now let's cross over to Cape Town and get a perspective from another GP. This time we're joined by Dr. Mamol Stoltz. Dr. Stoltz is the Sama... Uh, Vice Chairperson of the GP Private Practice Committee. Welcome to Health Talk, Dr. Stoltz. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Matuwang. Right. Perhaps let's just continue on, 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 you know, just hearing about, from your perspective, the challenges that you face in your day-to-day -day, um, practice. Uh, we, we've heard from Dr. Shange around the issue of, you know, uh, difficulties with patients. Also, you know, Dr. Muchuadi also touched on that a bit. Your perspective, please. Um, I think it's important for us as, as, as SAMA to relate to the public that the general practitioners in private healthcare is at a point of crisis. I think it's important for the public to realize that the National Health Act wants primary healthcare to be the backbone of healthcare in South Africa. And in private healthcare, that is not happening. The current legislative framework does not allow for primary health care to be the backbone of, of health care. And the general practitioner is at a crisis where we and our, and our uh, profession is being eroded, our scope of practice is being eroded, because most of the, of the benefit plans around medical aids are based on hospital-centric care. So our patients access care at the, long, at the wrong level. To, this morning I listened to a program on Cape Talk where patients complain about the very high cost of health care. But in private health care, the structure is so set up that patients actually are forced to, to, to enter, uh, enter health care at a very, very high level. And that is eroding the general practitioner's scope of practice and is actually trying to exclude the general practitioner out of private health care. Now, Dr. Stoltz, how then is your scope of practice curtailed insofar as primary health care delivery is concerned? It is the way the, op the benefit options of the medical uh, plans are, are, are set out. You know, in the early 2000s, in the early min uh, of the, uh, uh, earlier in this millennium, uh, the medical aids with the medical scheme, the new medical schemes act brought in um, managed health care. Now, managed health care was brought in to, to curtail costs, to bring down private health care costs because it was just too high. So we had this new role player, manage health care, coming into the sphere of the general practitioner and into private health care. But after 10, 15 years looking back, manage health care 
was not able to bring down the cost of, of private health care. It actually eroded the role of the general practitioner, the important role, because general practice is the backbone of health care in South Africa, and it eroded our role. And it actually has has discriminated against the poor patients. You know, in, in private health care, the patient that can afford does not pay in, does not have co-payments, can access care at all levels, but the patient who really are struggling to afford pr uh, private health care needs to buy down to options that offers very dismal, poor quality of care. And allows the patients or force the patients to, to enter care where it's very, very expensive. And it's, this has reached crisis points for the gen general practitioner and therefore in some other general practitioners is having an imbizo next week Saturday to decide how we are going to address this serious problem with the Department of Health and with the medical aid industry. All right. Perhaps let's, let's invite a comment from Dr. Letlape. Now, um, specifically around the role of the council, in, I mean, we've heard all the concerns that you know, the, the GPs have put on the table. What is the role of the council, if any, in, in protecting the GPs? And, and, and of course, I'll talk about you know, the other side, about protecting the public in this instance, or the patient in this instance. Well, firstly, to what Dr. Shanga spoke about, uh, the third party. Uh, council is not a third party. Council is a function of self-regulation. Yeah. I'm a private practitioner myself. I'm in private practice. And I'm not a third party disturbing the relationship between a GP and a patient. Mm. We're part of self-regulation. And I hope uh, GPs will see it as such because we have GPs that are involved in council structures. Mm. The second issue is that uh, what Dr. Stoltz raises is the key issue. Uh, the GP is being threat threatened by the way healthcare is funded. And that's the major problem. Mm. So the, gatekeep the important gatekeeping role of the GP has been diminished by the way private health has arranged the funding around hospitals, taking away the role of the GP. And, and that is the fundamental problem. So the issue of gatekeeping is a funding issue. And it's about how the funds are deployed and how the benefit structures are structured. But how can that be reversed, you know, by at the same time ensuring that medical schemes in this instance continue to be sustainable? Uh, I think that's a, a matter that we could discuss as a separate topic. Right. Uh, remember that medical aids are an act of parliament. And what we have done and what we have maintained is to divide the nation, separate them into the haves and the have-nots. Mm. And we have also failed to manage the resources of the haves mm. by creating a mechanism where the role of the primary physicians, the general practitioners, has been undermined, which has resulted in a very costly hospital-dependent system. And remember that everything depends on the vision of the government and on the directives from the Ministry of Health. Remember, that Act of Parliament is an act under the direct authority of the Minister of Health. So we need to create better funding mechanisms in accordance with Section 27 of the Constitution to ensure that all South Africans get better care and that the role of the GP in the future healthcare system becomes amplified. Mm. Unless we restore the GP to being the gatekeeper and a well-trained, trusted, quality person, our healthcare system will always struggle. Yeah. Okay. I think that's, as, as you quite rightly say, I mean, it's a matter that, uh, you know, can rightly, sh should rightly be discussed, you know, as a separate topic, and in fact, a whole show on its own for that matter. Dr. Shanga, what about the environment in which you practice? We spoke about, you know, the, the patients and the third parties and so the, the, and just the environment in which, in which you practice. Any challenges there? Yeah, I think just to, to add on to what uh, Dr. Momal has just said about the kind of the benefit schemes that are out there, we're actually finding that initially when these managed healthcare schemes came, they were supposed to be a lifesaver in terms of reducing the costs. And... 
unfortunately, what we are seeing now, if we are practicing, is that a lot of these low-cost uh, benefit schemes, what is actually happening is that they are putting efficiency in front of quality. Because what happens, there is a lot of rules around how you can manage a patient, what a patient can get on a, a scheme and what a patient cannot get on a scheme. Uh, there's protocols, guidelines, and the main thing why I want to go back to the patient-doctor relationship also being at stake is that when I see a patient sitting in front of me, unfortunately, in this kind of environment, I also see a patient who has got a particular medical aid. Then when I come to my management, I have to be thinking the medical aid of this patient, what is it that is going to allow me to give this patient? Then even if my management could have been management A, but then I go back and then I realize, oh, this patient is on this benefit. This benefit can only give A, B, C, but it don't give D and E and F. Mm. Then I have to change my management. Mm. And I think we end up having a sort of a, mo a, a moral problem there because we are supposed to practice ethically at all times for all the patients that are in front of us. Oh. But because of this kind of environment. And secondly, it also takes away a lot of my time that I should be spending with the patient. There's a lot of paperwork, admin work that I have to do. And there's a lot of uh, authorizations that I have to be doing medical aids. So you see the time that I will be spending seeing the patient, listening to the patient and managing the patient, I spend a lot of time now doing admin work. So it's robbing the patient of the doctor's time. All right, we're going to get back to that because, you know, uh, I mean, the other side of it is that once, of course, we appreciate all the challenges, you know, that you've outlined. But the question is, what have you been doing about it and, and what are you continuing to do about it? Because, uh, you know, the logical thing to do is to engage, you know, the, the, these third parties to see, you know, how you can arrive at common solutions. But anyway, we're going to go for a short commercial break. now. So when you or your loved one is in need of care, what determines the choice of who to consult, your GP or your specialist? More on that after the break. Please stay with us. Africa, Trevor Noah is leaving America in stitches. I never dreamed that I would one day have, well, two things really, um, an indoor toilet <laughs> and, and a job as host of The Daily Show. We are the first to bring you the latest films around the globe. Dear white people, the minimum requirement of black friends needed to not seem racist has just been raised to two. Cobham's Esseco is a gifted blind musician, a master of soothing notes from the piano. I love to sit behind the piano. You know, that also helps me find inspiration. In the distance, in Join Rifula Mulwa every Friday for that one-hour weekly dose of art and entertainment news at 9 p.m. on Trends. Welcome back to Health Talk. Now, it is not uncommon to hear people talk about my gynecologist, my pediatrician, my urologist, my neurologist, and so on and so forth. But why do people self-refer to specialists and bypass their GPs? We're going to find out from our guests. We still have in our Johannesburg studio Dr. Lindinguenya, Lindy Shange, sorry, yeah. who's in private practice in um, Pretoria, and Dr. Khosili Tlape, president of the HPCSA. But before we start discussion, we have... Dr. Nguenya on the line with, with a comment. Dr. Nguenya, welcome. Uh, how are you to you, Doc, and all the guests there? Good, good, good. Your question or, or, or comment, please. Okay. Mm, the problem that the general medical practitioners face, unfortunately, cannot actually be corrected in isolation. There are lots of reformations that actually need to happen in this country. 
Uh, that's why on the 28th of November, I think Professor Maz- Mazaza there will actually attest to this. We are having a general MBs or a sort of annual general meeting, CSIR Pretoria, where all general medical practitioners, inclusive of the medical officers, and this is just a technical terminology for those who are working in the hospitals, are actually invited to be actually there. Amongst other agenda that is going to be actually addressed is, I'm happy that my actually role model in the form of Dr. Litlape is now the president of the HPCSA. There was a history of a divide and rule in this country where you'll find that there is a health professional council of South Africa, there is a South African national council, and uh, with due respect, I'll agree that my role model, Dr. Litlape, will agree that a nurse is, is working for the Department of Health, is a health caregiver. A nurse is a professional that with those two variables, the person automatically qualifies to be under the health professional council of South Africa. Why the divide and rule leaves so much to be desired. Right. But okay. I encourage every GP or a general medical practitioner, as others want to be called, to be part of the Inviso, Professor Mazaza, and all some actual executives. All right. Dr. Nguyenyo, thank you, thank you very much. I think we get the gist of, of your call, and thank you for your comment. Do you want to respond, Dr. Ritlape? You use role model. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm a good role model, but thanks for those, for those words. Yeah. I think the key issue is that it's all about the money and it's about funding arrangements for healthcare. And as long as those are not sound, they are not based on the tenets of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, we'll always struggle. The key to personnel in terms of a sound healthcare system in South Africa are the general practitioner and the professional nurse. All right. Okay. And but until the, the issue of the professional nurse is, is another big one um, that I think is, is for another show. But uh, anyway, let, let's just get back to, to what we're talking about for now. We'll, we'll get back to you, uh, Dr. Litlepe. Self-referral. Just give me your perspective of why people self-refer. Why should people bypass you and you know, consult specialists directly? All right, we, we, we can just identify self-referral first, as to say it's when a patient who is at a primary health care level decides to access a higher level care without first going to their primary health care physician, in this case, who would be the GP. I think the reasons could be multifactorial. I may not know 100% of them, but I can talk about what we usually see most of the time. And I think in one of the insights there, you had one of the doctors who had his patients there, and he, he was saying that a lot of the time people have got a problem with these terms, general practitioner, family practitioner, specialist. And then people have the idea that if you are seen by a specialist, then you are getting better care. And then I think in the mind of the patient, it's actually not wrong because everybody wants better. Nobody wants less of anything. We all want better of everything. So in this patient's mind, if the idea is that I'm going to get better care if I see the specialist, obviously that's the way you're going to try and go. But in an uninformed patient, that might not be true. Now why I'm saying that is because the way our system is designed, both public and private, it's supposed to be that patients should be seen at least at a primary health care level then most of the problems actually are managed at a primary health care level. It would be like a pyramid. So if that particular problem of that particular patient is not being solved at a, a, a primary health care level, obviously there are ways to refer. Then you talk about referral. Then the family practitioner or the GP, knowing their scope of practice, knowing their skills and their limitations, will say this patient needs further care then the obvious thing is to refer. Mm. Now the problem comes with self-referral is that patients, when they self-refer, most of the time, unfortunately these days, we are faced with patients who Google a, a, a diagnosis and by the time they come to you, they don't tell you symptoms. They actually say, I've got a hyperparathyroidism. You know, that's how they consult. But then the problem is they will go to the specialist whom they think is going to best fit what they've Googled. Mm. But then when they go to the specialist, after a lot of investigations, and a, a lot of money is being paid, 
it's not the problem. Then okay. that specialist refers to another specialist, yeah. that one to another one. So by the end of the day, the patient has seen three, four, five specialists in order to have one diagnosis to be made. But All if right. Okay, it's fine. Let's hold it there because I want to get the uh, view from Dr. Stoltz in our Cape Town studio. Dr. Stoltz, are you there with us? Yes, I'm right. still here. In terms of self-referral, what is your opinion with regards to the fact, you know, there are some people out there that uh, basically hold the view that specialists sometimes e encourage this practice by accepting, you know, seeing these patients without asking them whether or not, you know, they've been referred by their GPs. Your thoughts on that? No, that is totally true. The fact of the matter is that the medical schemes allow the patients to self-refer. And a lot of the options, such as patients joining um, um, or only taking out hospital plans, feel that they can, uh, as Dr. Lindy Shanga said, make their own diagnosis and refer themselves. And there's no, there's no uh, structure, structure in the Medical Schemes Act that actually prevent that. And patients feel that going directly to a specialist will save them at least the cost to see a general practitioner. So it comes back to the point I made earlier where a patient actually access care at a very costly level, yet when they are charged a lot and when they have to pay in a lot, they come back and say, but the doctors are very expensive mm. and therefore eroding the role of the general practitioner. I think it's it's. It's so important for us as general practitioners to tackle this issue head on with the Department of Health who needs to change the legislation as well uh, of the Medical Schemes Act and to enforce primary health care to take its, its important role at base level in private health care so that we can prevent the self-referral. All right, let's hear from a specialist. Unfortunately, we have one in studio, Dr. Letlape. Do you encourage self-referral? Do you see patients without referral from well, a GP? Be before we get there, uh, I think we must all just be mindful that medical aids cover less than 15% of the population. Mm. And this discussion should be about 100% of South Africans accessing care. Right. That's the first issue. The second issue is, you rightfully said, uh, people speak about my gynae, my ophthalmologist, my this. We need to get back to where people talk about my family practitioner mm. or our GP, mm. which is what we are raised with. And we need to find ways of getting back to that mm. so that as we have well-trained GPs, as we go back to the practitioner that serves a family, the practitioner that is in the community, mm. patients must be talking about my GP. Right. And then your GP would then be the person that protects you, mm. the person that guides you. Right. The person that ensures that you're not going to have fruitful and wasteful expenditure going all over the place. Right. The person that will coordinate your care. Yeah. What, so Dr. we Dr. need to, to foster that. Yeah. Uh, the issue of self-referral yeah. is about funding. You see, yeah. if I'm paying for myself yeah. and I know how the system works or doesn't work, yeah. I'll want to go there. Take a leave from the lawyers. Yeah. You can't go to senior counsel without an instructing attack. All right. I think I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there because we'll run out of time. So what is care coordination? That and more after the break. Please stay with us. SABC News. We report, contextualize, and present news and current affairs honestly, fairly, and fully. We consider it a duty to provide consistent, relevant, useful, and top quality information and analysis. Our mission is to provide credible, accurate, and interesting news programming, bringing news into everyone's homes in everyone's languages. Thank you, South Africa, for relying on SABC News for quality news output and for making us your number one source of information. SABC News, Africa's news leader.
Welcome to Network, a technology news program that also discusses what's trending in social media in and around Africa. MTN has launched its new movie and television streaming service, Front Row. If it's trending, we will find it. That's Network with me, Spumana Lezondi, every Sunday at 7.30 p.m. only on the SABC News Channel. Welcome back. Now, one of the reasons why healthcare costs have continued to rise at rates above inflation is lack of care coordination. So what is care coordination and what role can the GP play in this? Well, let's find out from our guests. In Johannesburg, we still have Dr. Lindy Shange, a practicing general practitioner in Pretoria. And in our Cape Town studio, we have Prof. Shadrick Mazaza back with us. Uh, perhaps let's start with you, Prof. Um, what is, in simple terms, I mean, you, you, have, you have extensive experience in the medical aid industry. What is care coordination? Um, care coordination, I think to understand it, uh, one needs to understand this, and that is that um, when the modern healthcare started, all the doctors were general practitioners, and then specialization started. Uh, and fragmentation of care, which followed it. Uh, individuals going to specific doctors for a specific area of their body anatomy, if may, we may use that. And general pract practice development after that was to try and make sure that patients do see a doctor who is able to deal with all their problems and decide with them in consultation with the patients whether or not they need to see a specialist for a specific thing. And coordination of care that the medical aid schemes are trying to introduce have to be seen in that uh, context, in the sense that, as Dr. Letrape has said earlier on, one of the problems we have in private uh, practice in South Africa is the fact that there are obviously many specialists, and uh, doctors and patients particularly have a tendency to go to different specialists without actually understanding whether or not there's a need for that to happen. And we know what the result of that is. I won't go into it again because Dr. Letrape mentioned it. So coordination is actually trying to bring back proper quality health care for the patient, whereby there is a general practitioner, a family doctor, who should be the one to deal with most of their health problems and in consultation with the patient, then coordinate the care as to whether or not they need which specialist to see, and when that specialist has seen the patient, for the patient to be referred back to that general practitioner to explain and make sure the patient understands what the specialist is recommending, what the specialist has done. All right. And Do that's what coordination of care is about. All right. Um, let's get a perspective from you, Dr. Shang. Um what role does, I mean, we've heard that obviously the person that should champion coordinate of care, coordination of care is, is the GP. Is that happening? And how can it be strengthened? Um, I'll say to, say to a certain extent, yes, but I think there's still a big gap and I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Because um, I see that the general practitioner is at a level where they can offer equitable care and they are re easily accessible to, to the patients. But now, when we say care coordination, I think we can use the analogy of a conductor in an orchestra. The conductor doesn't need to know all the instruments that all these people in a choir are playing, but he needs to conduct so that they play harmonious music. You can imagine if all of them were playing their own tunes in their own way you know, we'll all close our ears. So the same thing here happens that we are saying the GP should actually reclaim that space of being the care coordinator of the patient at a primary health care level. And who's going to be the greatest benefactor of I care coordination? The patient more than you can mean. Right. Because w w just now we've talked about the cost implications when they start seeing different people only at the end of the day to find that the diagnosis is this one. But at the same time, we also avoid duplication of services. You also 
you would avoid even medical errors because what happens when patients see different people, yeah. especially specialists, they don't really mention that I've got this medication from this doctor, from that doctor. Yeah. When they come, you'll be surprised when they look at the patient's list yeah. that there's actually medication that is contraindicated or is interacting with the other ed medication that they got from somebody else, okay. but they are not aware as I'm a afraid patient. we're going to have to leave it there because unfortunately we've run out of time. Dr. Lindy Shang, General Practitioner, Johannesburg, thank you for, thank you for being part of the show. Prof. Shadrick Mazaza in Cape Town, thank you so much for your contribution and being part of our show. And of course, um, our other guests, Dr. Letlape and Dr. Mamo Stoltz. Folk, it's on that note that we come to the end of our show today, unfortunately. Join us again next week on SABC News. A reminder to please share your views and comments with us on our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk, and on, you know, follow us on Twitter at SABC Health Talk. Remember that you can watch the repeat of this show today at 2 p.m. and again on Tuesday at 5 a.m. Or simply go to the SABC YouTube link uh, to get all our previous show. I'm Dr. Salam Daoum. Thank you so much for, for watching our program and please do take care. makes it its business every evening to round up the leading local stories and international news to keep you informed all the time. Make a date with Your World every evening for all the news headlines around the world to keep you abreast with knowledge. Catch Your World for headlines across the world every Monday to Friday from 9pm then Saturday and Sunday from 7pm. Health workers are at risk of violence all over the world. In South Africa, nearly half of the nurses suffer abuse at some point in their careers. The violence range from harassment to assault, both verbal and physically. Um, violence, it has a psychological, emotional you know, impact on a person, particularly if it's verbal. Whatever words the perpetrator may actually have used on the victim, you find that it can affect um, the victim psychologically as well as emotionally. We find that some people actually they become withdrawn and some people they become um, sick, they don't come to work, or they can actually be aggressive in some instances against everybody at work. So that's why we have um, you know, a system in place where we do counseling for them. And if it's actually physical, uh, employees are made aware that they can actually even report to either labor which is an internal um, it's an internal body to assist them but if it's they feel that it's not enough and um, they can actually go and report it even to the police if it's physically and they feel that they really want to open a case against the perpetrator many more are exposed to verbal aggression and in most cases the perpetrators are patients or visitors I have personally been violated by relatives and yeah, you find that in cases whereby there is, they have their patient here, they want to come and see their patient at any time and when you try to explain to them that they have vis uh, visiting hours that are stipulated to say from 3 to 5, they'll say no, it's our patient, it's our family, it's our relative, we have to see them whenever we want to see them. And then even though you try to show them, okay, this is the policy that's written down, they don't understand because they want to see their relative at any time that they want to or they feel they can see him. Sometimes the community is not being fair on us staff, including nurses, doctors and all. I haven't been physically attacked, but you know we, we are not uh, brought up in the same way. There are people who are very rude when they consult. There are people who are insulting and all that, but as a health professional person, you don't take that to heart or to hate, you know, you, you just think, oh, okay, there must be an underlying reason for the person to behave the way he or she is behaving. So normally I don't take it personally. Categories of health workers most at risk include nurses and other staff directly involved in patient care, emergency room staff and paramedics. The nurses, it's not fair on them to be violated. The young doctors, 
any doctors. They also get it. They get their share. They get their fair share, but the nurses get it first. Violence against health workers is unacceptable. It has not only a negative impact on the psychological or physical well-being of healthcare staff, but also affects their job motivation. Most of the health workers, some of them, they still don't come out, you know, to report violence in the workplace. And um, so we encourage them actually to, you know, to speak out and to report violence in the workplace. And we still have to, you know, as, as staff in the wellness, we still also have to do a lot of marketing and, you know, make the staff aware of the programs that we have in terms of the procedures to follow when there's the workplace violence. Some of them, they still don't know what procedures to follow, who to contact. So that one, I say it's a limitation on our side, but we are working on it. So I would encourage them to speak out and to come forth and to report. All healthcare workers in South Africa devote their lives to working under all types of conditions in order to improve the lives of South Africans in need of public health care. I feel that it's unfair for the nurses to be violated while they are working in their working place because they are here to serve a purpose, to help the community and to help the patient. So people are coming with different ideas of a, a particular principle to say we've got an access to come in, I've got a right to stay with my patients. These are the problems that we are having. Most of the time they just want to sit with their family inside. Just if, imagine if you've got one patient with 20 relatives, it's not fair for other patients and we are unable to work. That's where the problem comes and they fight a lot. Mm -hmm.